بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ویورز ویلکم ٹو ڈیفینس اینڈ ڈپلومیسی آئی ایم یور ہوسٹ سلطان ایم حالی اکٹوبر ٹوئنٹی سیونتھ از این آمینس ڈیٹ آن دس ڈے سکسٹی فور ایئرز ارلیئر دا انڈین فورسز لینڈڈ ان سری نگر اینڈ آکیوپائڈ کشمیر ریزلٹنگ ان ون آف دا گریٹسٹ فیسٹرنگ سورس بٹوین دا ٹو نیبرز وچ ہیز لیڈ ٹو اے نمبر آف وارز اینڈ ریمینز ان ریزالٹ وی وش دیٹ دی پیپل آف جموں اینڈ کشمیر گیٹ دیئر فریڈم سون ٹوڈے دی یو ایس سیکرٹری آف اسٹیٹ ہیلری کلنٹن از آلسو گوئنگ ٹو پریزینٹ ہر کیس ان فرنٹ آف دا یو ایس کانگریشنل کمیٹی اینڈ ڈسکس دی وار ان افغانستان بٹ آر پروگرام ٹوڈے ان وچ وی ول ڈسکس دی وزٹ آف میڈم ہیلری کلنٹن اینڈ می آلسو ٹچ اپن پاکستان's entry into the UN Security Council for another two years, but we would like to talk about that Pakistan's stance on the war in Afghanistan is proving to be correct. To discuss all these issues, we are honored to have in our studio today Air Vice Marshal Shehzad Chaudhary, welcome, and Dr. Farrokh Saleem. Shehzad, the uh, Time magazine of October 24, 2011, in its article saying why the U.S. cannot win the war in Afghanistan, Richard Haas says that the U.S. is losing the war in Afghanistan and the war isn't worth fighting for. What is the halabulu? Well, I think uh, the U.S. has come to realize uh, after the 10-year-long effort that there is no military victory in, in any such war. In fact, in any irregular war, victory is always relative. Um, you can only uh, qualify a victory in many ways or a defeat in many ways. And therefore, um, there is very little chance of clear military victory. Uh, a military only creates space. Even in a regular war, what to talk of an irregular war. And a military action must be able to only give you that space for political uh, action to follow. Um, and that is the sense of any war and, and particularly this type of a war. Uh, I think finally the U.S. has reached that point where it realizes that having tried all means, it must now let the political plank take the leading role there. Uh, for some time, there has been a tussle in Washington between the military as well as the policy, political side of um, various efforts uh, as to which one must dominate the, 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 or, or lead the effort in Afghanistan. Um, I, it seems to me that after uh, Hillary Clinton's last visit when her, her delegation was packaged in a way that the military was represented, the CIA was represented, and so therefore the message that she brought along was very simple, that uh, the, the political side must take the lead, and Pakistan has been saying that for a long, long time. So in many ways, she has agreed with what Pakistan has been su suggesting, that negotiations, uh, reconciliation, reintegration would be the best way forward, and uh, that is the best way for Uh, the U.S. to find a way out of Afghanistan and for the region to stabilize, for Afghanistan to stabilize and for Pakistan to stabilize. But Dr. Farooq Saleem, doesn't it vindicate Pakistan's position? If you recall, in the early years of the war when the Taliban were defeated and were weak, that was the time Pakistan had projected that uh, the U.S. must now resort to talking to the Taliban and finding a political solution. Now it seems to be rather late in the day because the same Taliban have been invigorated and they seem to be winning. Ali Sahib, I feel that we end up spending too much time on discussing as to what the U.S. ought to be doing with the Taliban or uh, what the U.S., uh, the kind of U.S., the kind of problems that U.S. is facing in Afghanistan. Uh, I think we should actually be concentrating on what our future planning ought to be. Um, I think there is a plan A in place as far as the Americans are concerned. Um, they actually want to subdue uh, the resistance uh, or, the, or the, the, resistance, the fighters, the Mujahideen, by using Pakistan um, and eventually bringing uh, the Taliban and other factions uh, to a negotiating table and they would want to negotiate with them from a position of strength. That's their plan A. Um, what happens if Pakistan does not uh, bow down to uh, U.S. demands and does not uh, actually um, take on the militants uh, to um, uh, enable uh, the U.S. to uh, negotiate from a position of strength? I, genuinely believe that the Americans really don't have a plan B. But Pakistan doesn't even have a plan A. I mean, we, we have at least uh, three or four different uh, factions of Taliban. Uh, there's the anti-India um, militants, there's the anti-Afghan militants, and then there are anti-Pakistan militants. Um, and um, 
once the U.S. actually pulls out from Afghanistan, um, I think we are uh, going to be facing all of these uh, um, ideologically driven forces that are bent upon uh, capturing physical Pakistani terrain and impose their own rules and regulations um, on, on the Pakistani population. So I think uh, rather than spending maybe three quarters of all of our discussions on what the United States is going to be doing, we ought to come up with our own planning um, as to what our plans would be, plan A, plan B, and plan C, uh, once the American forces actually pull out of Afghanistan. But we appear to see that as far as you mentioned that we don't have a plan but uh, with this visit of uh, Hillary Clinton, it appears that uh, all the different aspects of Pakistan's leadership, that is the military, the political, as well as the intelligence, were on the same page in dealing with the US. And it appears that they have transgressed now from the, uh, taking the do more dictation to enough is enough. Uh, Air Marshal, what would you say yeah, to look, that? I mean, I, just to continue the point that uh, Dr. Farooq was just making, I think we got to disaggregate uh, the, the, the entire situation. If we don't do that, we'll get ourselves into a, into a very difficult uh, maze, in fact. And so what I suggest is that if we look at Afghanistan as one of the issues, of course, without, doubt, without a doubt connected to our internal situation also, but it's a very important player as to how Pakistan has been impacted or impinged in the last 10 years. Uh, and if somehow we are able to resolve Afghanistan, uh, at least a part of those who become a threat to Pakistan's stability in terms of the Taliban or the militant groups uh, could perhaps be uh, stabilized or secured in a certain way. And then you are left with the second part of the problem, which is your internal situation, which basically deals with the groups that are now uh, rooted in, in Pakistan and you got to deal with those. And there is no doubt that Pakistan will need a more comprehensive and an integrated uh, policy to do that. And Pakistan hasn't uh, been able to to come up with the, with that type of a policy and that's a very big gaping hole in Pakistan's uh, yes uh, I think Pakistan has learned in the last about 10 years Pakistan has learned in a way that Pakistan uh, went along with a policy which was not very well defined uh, and ultimately perhaps reached a point when it realized that it has taken enough beating and cannot take any more beating you know that's the point that when perhaps we all gave up in, in all institutions of the state uh, Abdullah Boskert uh, this Turkish uh, journalist and analyst his article today has been carried by some of the Pakistani media too and he says very clearly that there's only a certain uh, you see depth to which Pakistan can be pushed and perhaps Pakistan has reached that depth and it cannot be pushed any further. You know when we say in terms of being pushed to a point is it seems that as if Pakistan has capacity to do more and Pakistan is not doing more. Uh, and I don't say this in terms of the military capacity. The military may still have the capacity to actually launch maybe a couple of more operations and, and they could perhaps do that. But I think the, the, the capacity of the state and the society is something which is of much greater concern to my judgment. I don't think the society has any more, uh, you know, still left in it to be able to, the, 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 the way that the fissures have developed, the way that the divisions have taken place in the last 10 years. You see, you have an environment of strife which has actually dominated you how you, you're living in the last 10 years. And that is what has given rise and an opportunity for these div div divisions and fissures to work. I think that's a very imp uh, important area that we need to worry about. We need to nurse those back. We need to make sure that we somehow get healed up over there. And the second aspect is, of course, the economy. So if either, neither your economy nor your society is capable of holding something or holding on to something or get together or stay together, I think the, the dangers are far more. And that's an area that Pakistan perhaps reached and realized that some semblance of unity needs to emerge out of the various uh, players uh, of the, at the level of the state and therefore that is what sort of gave us a view as if everybody is on the same page and we have given a, uh, a, a, a unified, unified, stance, right. a unified stance. Let, let me take uh, Chaudhry Saab's argument um, a bit further, uh, mm -hmm. a step ahead, um, desegregating the issues and the problems. Uh, I think this region right now is engulfed into at least three distinct different, uh, different wars that have different characteristics. West of the Durant Line, is, is a freedom struggle going on where there are forces that are fighting for their freedom against occupying forces. Now, west, uh, sorry, east of the Duran Line and west um, of the Indus River is an active insurgency on Pakistani physical terrain. Uh, there are insurgent forces that actually want to capture Pakistani terrain. So we, we need to have an anti-insurgency uh, policy uh, in, that part of the, in that part of Pakistan. East of Indus River and west of the uh, Pak-India border um, is primarily terrorism, where, are, where there are militant forces that come 
uh, do what they have to do and then mellow back and melt uh, back into, uh, into where they came from. Mm -hmm. That's the region where we need an anti-terrorism policy. So a specific anti-insurgency policy in one part, of the, one part of Pakistan and an anti-terrorism uh, policy. And we lack, lack them both. We have neither. Right. So uh, point taken. We need to segregate these and work upon it. But uh, tell me, uh, what do you make of the propaganda campaign which is continuing? For example, last night I was watching the BBC's program, Secret Pakistan. I wonder if you saw it, in which they have pulled out some uh, to me, they appeared incognito Taliban who are uh, sort of uh, claiming that they received training from the ISI. Now, if with this kind of, uh, you see, propaganda campaign, it's going to hurt the effort which needs to be launched to get peace. Yeah, I know. I, I, I fully agree with you. I think the situation is so loose and so... Um, uh, out of control, frankly speaking, in the areas of strife and in and, and this entire region, that uh, so many players uh, are, are actually, uh, you know, sort of into their into the kitchen and you know trying to play with the broth there. Uh, how does it? How does the broth end up? In, at the end of the day, is going to be a spoiled broth. <coughs> but uh, I think what the, there are there are some uh, so there are some valid things as well that we need to keep in mind. Uh, people will continue to sort of focus on to Pakistan or put Pakistan in spotlight because of the uh, perhaps uh, wrongly conceived policies that we've lived with for a very, very long time. Um, we have lived with those policies. We have pursued those policies. I think it's time for Pakistan to stand up and face this fact and say, yes, our policies have been wrong, which have led this country and this nation into the position that we are in today. So someone somewhere needs to make an immediate rectification to that, and we must, and that will begin with first accepting this particular thing. Two, the world is going to, of course, uh, exploit this, this, this particular vulnerability of Pakistan. Now, the BBC may not like us or someone in the BBC may not like us or someone else might actually pick up another program and do something else. But we've got to see that first, our own act needs to clean up. We need to put our house in order. And thirdly, make sure that we continue to be, be seen as relevant and clean players in the world. Unless or until we are relevant, we are clean players and we are responsible players in the world, I don't think the world is going to look at us uh, very kindly. And that's an area that we as people of Pakistan and, and people who live here in Pakistan and who belong to Pakistan are deeply worried about in the way that the world perceives Pakistan. So I'm not worried about what is coming out on the BBC or the CNN today, but I'm going to be worried about what all other people say about me in 10 years' time. What do they think of Pakistan? And that's going to be the worrying point. And I think now is the time that changes and transformations and uh, corrections and rectifications must be made to our way of uh, but Dr. Things. Farooq Salim, how do you see this? I mean, we have all highlighted the problem, but let's uh, talk about solutions. As an economist, how would you co apply a course correction? A modern national security strategy of any country that actually guarantees the longevity of the state, the nation state itself, uh, has to be a multi-dimensional strategy and a multi-organizational strategy. Um, I think the way I look at Pakistan's national security strategy or the development of it, evolution of it over the past six decades or so, is that it continues to stand on just one leg, which is a military strategy. So our national security strategy uh, has just one organization involved in it, and it's unidimensional. It only has military component in it. Uh, what we need is to have an economic component into it, and what we need is to have a diplomatic component into it. So a national security strategy that is comprehensive in nature, it has the military strategy, which is all important, plus a developmental economic standpoint into it, or input into it, and a diplomatic face to it. Um, unless we have a multi-dimensional and a multi-organizational national security strategy, uh, we would continue to face uh, the problems that we, that we are facing now. So the national, a national security strategy that is so dependent on the use of armed non-state uh, non militant actors, whether in the East or the West, uh, would have to be modified and rectified. Can I, can I just add sure, on to sure. this? You know, having lived all my life in the military and having worked there, uh, the the armed non-state actor is is not uh, someone that uh, the, the the security policy sort of revolves around. Uh, I think that should be pretty clear to us in terms of our military strategy or the military thinking. It's he he, he plays no part whatsoever in our in our military thinking or military strategy. He's not a player. He's not a function. He's not recognized. 
I mean, we begin to recognize him only once when we come out of the military and realize or find out that there is so much hullabaloo about it. Uh, so in terms of professional military part of our, our security policy, he has absolutely zero role there. Now, if he has a role or he has had a role as a part of the past sort of a flow over from the uh, Mujahideen or the Soviet Mujahideen type in, into, into uh, usages in other areas. Now, that's been something that has flowed from another situation into another situation and perhaps that has come back to hound us. As far as the military is concerned, the military will only do its job in terms of its own mission. And the mission is entirely security related in terms of its perceived threats from the outside. And it's dictated by the national strategy. Uh, clearly, in, in the sense that he, they, they have been given a mission to defend the country from outer threats. Now, those outer threats could be a combination of their uh, state sort of uh, enterprises as well as what is affiliated in terms of any intelligence actions that they do or the perception of it and therefore the military would react to those situations. When the military talks of the economics model or for that matter the social model, it is basically feeding or strengthening its military mission. You know, in terms of it only takes as much part of it which is going to strengthen its mission. What has been lacking and I will support Dr. Farooq there fully, what has been lacking is these other aspects. Since we have never had a more resolute economic policy, nor a social policy, nor a social political policy, or a social economic policy. So therefore, those gaps of the national security strategy being missing, you know, and therefore it seems that there is only one. And it has taken us to a point where people within Pakistan feel that perhaps the military dominates every part of the strategy or every part of the policy, which is not true. The military is neither capable of doing that, nor it is, uh, it, it, it's, nor is it's, its, its role, yeah. nor is it its role, and, there, and neither it is qualified to do that, frankly speaking. So therefore, they only use those parts which are actually feeding its own military mission, and it gives a feeling as if they, you know, sort of have a more encompassing hold over everything, just, just because the other sides have been lacking and not doing their work uh, well enough. Right. Dr. Farooq Salim, I want to solicit your opinion on another development which took place last Friday. Pakistan got elected to the UN Sec National Security Council for a two-year period. And this uh, prime of AC appears to be an achievement. I was a little perturbed that we were up against uh, Kyrgyzstan and it was a narrow margin. Yes, we need to celebrate. But at the same time, do you think we need to do some soul searching that we need to make more friends? The way our foreign policy stands right now is that it's been creating more and more enemies as opposed to friends. And uh, the primary objective of any country's foreign policy ought to be to create and make more friends than creating enemies. Um, we need to look at um, how the election at the, at the General Assembly um, is, is conducted. This is basically an Asia-Pacific seat. and There were only two countries contesting it. Um, beyond that, I think we're getting, we're getting isolated. Uh, we're getting isolated in terms of international support to our stance. Um, I think uh, of the 193 member states of the United Nations, um, it'll be very difficult to even come up with three or four of them um, that, would, uh, that we could call them as, as Pakistan's friends. Um, and this is, this is a scary phenomenon to be, to be heading into. Uh, we, need to, um, uh, we need to modify our, our foreign policy stances and uh, we need to uh, uh, adjust our internal regulations uh, to um, to harmonize them uh, with what's happening um, uh, around us or, or universally. Uh, otherwise, we'll get even more isolated, and an isolated Pakistan is in, is in no one's interest. Absolutely, uh, Air Marshal. In the same context, th uh, we supported India for its bid for a membership last year, and India paid us back quid pro quo, and they supported it this time. There was also a very interesting comment by S.M. Krishna, the Indian external minister, external affairs minister, on the eve of uh, Hillary Clinton's visit here. And he said that Pakistan and the U.S. must sort out their problems so that the region is more secure. This is the first time that they're talking about this. How do you look at this uh, change in stance? Well, I, I really could not make out why did Krishna have to make this statement. I mean, I, I, because it must go along with the, with the, with the general um, uh, trend of how India has been responding to so many things in the region. Uh, for one, India must become, be seen to be more mature in its uh, interaction with Pakistan than what it has showed in the last about 
four, five, ten years or so ever since India has actually taken off on an economic prosperity route. Uh, that sort of a maturity and uh, responsibility must be seen more often in India. Well, it's a good statement to make. Uh, but of course, Pakistan would like to see what happens in the future in terms of how India reacts to it. Just to, 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 to measure up and to uh, balance the whole thing, as soon as the helicopter landed, uh, you know, the one helicopter that actually was forced landed in Pakistan and had to, and, and Pakistan sent it back, uh, there was a statement by the Deputy Minister of Defense from India. And he said, well, this action doesn't mean much or doesn't mean anything. We continue to look at Pakistan in terms of how Pakistan will do in the future and, and how Pakistan reacts. And Pakistan is so many things need to be rectified in Pakistan before Pakistan, we, we look at Pakistan with any favor. Now, that's the kind of uh, sense that you get out of India. Now, I'm not saying that Pakistan doesn't make those errors as well. I think both India and Pakistan will need to learn to be more mature, more responsible and sincere to the fact that they are the two important countries in the region. And without them actually sorting the things out between them more importantly than the uh, Pakistan and the US, I think that is how the region will begin to move forward. And if till that happens, I think both will look at each other with a bit of a suspicion and uh, animosity. Yeah. Uh, coming back to this uh, war on terror and Pakistan's stance, Dr. Farooq, since we are coming to the end of the program, what are your proposals as far as Pakistan taking a stance on this is concerned? Pakistan has already agreed to be part of the reconciliation process. It has offered its services, but it has said that decisions must be made by the USA. Who is going to do what? and how much committed the U.S. is to the process of an Afghan-led re re reconciliation. And so we are essentially in a state of uh, severe internal conflict. Um, and the primary drivers are, are, are more within Pakistan than they are outside of Pakistan. Um, and when a state is in, in a state of conflict, uh, usually there's um, either two or three uh, ways out. Either you uh, completely dominate uh, the other party, um, or you try and persuade them to integrate with the mainstream. Um, there isn't any, any you know, it's, it's not a full play that uh, there's two or three different options that, that you can actually take. Um, and past historical record uh, of some 150 internal conflicts over the past 50 years or so, uh, the conclusion is that in 95% of the time, the state would have to declare a military victory uh, against its um, uh, against its opponent, uh, writing down, sitting down, uh, writing peace agreements uh, is only uh, only five percent of the uh, of the of the cases has that been successful. So it has to be the state um, achieving uh, a final military victory against okay. its opponent. Right. So viewers, with that we come to the end of this debate and. Uh, we see that both our participants have agreed that Pakistan's position has been vindicated to some extent, but Pakistan needs to get its act together. And more importantly, it has to make clear policies on the economic, on the socio-economic, as well as uh, the military fields. And unless it does that, it would not only remain isolated, it is also likely to face the ignominy of further uh, suppression of the rights of the people. But to end on a happier note, of course, we did win a seat in the United Nations Security Council, but that does not mean that we should rejoice over it. Instead, we should try and make more friends and less enemies. Thank you so much. Keep sending us your comments, and we would like to see you next week, inshallah. Allah Hafiz.